Okay, let's look at three different views and where we have come today. The first is traditional Christianity. <coughs> traditional Christianity. And uh, in traditional Christianity, generally, uh, there is a belief that, um, uh, okay, let me use a different color for the belief system. Traditional, now we are not traditional Christianity. I want to make that very clear. But traditional Christianity has always believed, and uh, let's do the planet Earth here. Planet Earth is here. Heaven is there. H for heaven. So the progression, okay, let me do heaven in blue. Say dark blue. Okay, this is a darker blue, looks like. Heaven, okay. Wow, this is still black. Okay, let's remove that. And have, okay, not that good coloring, but that's heaven. And then, where do I make this? Uh, where's the gray color? And then this is hell. Traditional Christianity have always believed that only those who accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior will, so those who accepted Christ, accept Christ, AC, when those who accept Christ, then they go to heaven. And in heaven, there's no place for anybody else who did not accept Christ. There's a Christianity that we, we came into uh, for those first generation, second or third generation, and it's always been that view. That means that there's a lot of people in hell. Because anyone who does not have Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, their view is go in, yeah, boing, and that's it. Which means that there are very few people in heaven because Christianity throughout all the ages has never ever succeeded in winning the whole world. Even at a time when it was official Roman religion, Roman Christian, uh, Roman Empire religion under Constantine, uh, not everyone actually knew and accepted Christ. Some were just by name. They have known nothing about the Bible or about Christ. So I would say, you know, the Billy Graham style, oh, you accept Christ, yeah, then you're saved. You don't accept Christ, you're condemned. And that's it. And we quote Mark chapter 16. It has no answer for two things. We accepted it, but we didn't realize there's holes in our theology. A hole in the theology which theologians just, you know, wipe it away, hide it, you know, uh, just uh, uh, don't prioritize it. But there are two holes in the theology. And um, I will use a different color to write that. One is, what happened to those millions who were born before Jesus Christ came? So they were both those, I call that, before Christ, B.C. And then after Christ, those who never heard the gospel, N.H., never have a chance to hear the gospel, or the gospel not presented correctly. It is assumed by default that this group also go to hell, this group also go to hell. You ask any traditional Christian pastor, and they say that. So, hell is huge. Heaven is a Christian club. That's traditional Christianity. And uh, because of this traditional view, Christianity has always made an enemy of every other religion. 
because in their belief system any religion that believes that they are the only one going to heaven and no one else is safe except going to their religion is a religion that can never work in unity with other religions if they work in unity it is because they put down their guns and sort of don't threaten one another in order to have some sort of uh, dayton not really a peace treaty because they say I war each other because as they look across the table their eyes and thinking in the theology say that guy's going to hell, that guy's going to hell, that guy's going to hell, that guy's going to hell and so their working is very superficial very superficial and almost good governments in every country have always wanted to have freedom of religion but harmony of religion is a very important thing and it's very important in Singapore especially when you have you grew in a background with various religions and so I asked traditional Christianity with that kind of a view how can they ever work sincerely with any other religion so we leave it for that remember before anyone runs away with this to me this is a wrong view because it's not really supported by the Bible and there's not enough Bible teaching it's only supported by one or two verses here and there like John 14 6 I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but by me and so we interpret it in that way that going to the Father equals salvation but going to the Father might be a level of knowing God ah you're seeing the interpretation all we use verses like Mark 16 he that does not believe is condemned so we pick verses here and there without examining all the other verses but just before you begin to look at this view just to shake you a little bit for those of you who believe traditional Christianity especially those of you hearing online what about the Jews before they came to know Christ are they safe or not safe everyone here say they're safe or not safe you say they're safe okay now you might say because their religion points to Christ in some way what about Cornelius in Acts 10 who is a Roman soldier who might not have any knowledge of God and he prayed to a God whom he does not know he gave arms, he's a good religious man he's a good soldier serving the Roman Empire in Acts 10 if Cornelius died before he reached Peter remember the angel appeared to him and asked him to send to Peter who will tell him the words of salvation <coughs> now what happened if Cornelius died before that before Peter come to him will he be safe or not safe yes he says safe ah see that began to challenge tradition Christianity because according to traditional Christianity Cornelius if he didn't accept Christ he would die and he would be in hell but you see the funny thing is in Acts chapter 10 the angel told him and this is before Peter came to him the angel told him your prayers have come before God as a memorial before God think about it if the answer for traditional Christianity is Cornelius is going to hell unless Peter came and tell him the good news imagine he went to hell and there's a memorial up there <laughs> before God and God was pleased with the memorial God was happy but the man who made it is dying in hell something is not consistent and we never challenge that view so I'm going to go to this view which will be the correct view but before that most of the religions in the world are monotheistic except some that are uh, of course you call humani 
humanitarian uh, humanism as not a religion but uh, or uh, communism doesn't believe in a god but believe in just n the natural world uh, these are uh, the, uh, what I call atheistic kind of religions if you can call it a religion or a philosophy is the correct word for that but then you go to they, but what, most of these just deal with almost all religion teach about good and bad and uh, if you are very good then you get through if you're very good then you get through wow just for today when we talk about hell you go zap 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 right <laughs> okay okay when you're, you're good and bad and if you're good if you know good deeds you get in you, you have bad deeds and you drop out and and the balance is there and you know if if there's any balance in such a thing a microgram could be like that already that means you could miss heaven by a microgram Foop, kind of thing and that, there you go like there, there's not even like a margin of uh, correction. Let's say you up to 10% or 20% of this margin error still redeem, redeemer. So you can see every philosophy f is challenged in that. But at least most of these philosophies are what I call um, monotheistic religion, which is a belief in the one God and maybe you know other smaller deities. But then there is this belief of reincarnation. There is enshrined into some belief system, some philosophies. And um, so let me draw all these little things. Ah, this is a one. Let me do the earth again. Here we will have an earth. And, um, and let's do a heaven. Okay. It's a heaven. We do a heaven. And then the gray scale is hell here. Hell down here. <coughs> there is a philosophy of um, reincarnation that is becoming more and more popular. That is actually not taught in the Bible, even though some New Age religion uh, on the websites, they teach that, you know, uh, that people are very similar, like Abraham Lincoln and, and John Kennedy, uh, so there must be reincarnations. Um, and also, people like Edgar Cayce, who uh, is uh, one of the New Age people, who uh, is called a sleeping prophet, and he sees things, uh, speaks things while he is in a subconscious state. And he began to talk about reincarnation and it became very, very popular. And um, so there's a belief system of reincarnation that, um, and let me do the circle here, how is it? Ah, here it is. And um, now all these ties to the main topic, I've got to see the overall view before I zoom in to what are overcomers, our title today. So that is. They never start with, don't know where the souls came from, don't know where the souls exist before, but like you're born into this uh, cycle of reincarnation, cycle after cycle of reincarnation, cycle and cycle after. And if you, if you do bad things, then your next life could be different, different. Now, within reincarnation are also different philosophies, different subgroups. There's a group that believe in reincarnation, where you could be reincarnated as an insect, or as a tree, as a gorilla, as a giraffe, or animal. So that one is like, I would, call, I would classify that as, you know, 100% reincarnation to anything. And so that's why, you know, the cockroach walking around could be, you know, a reincarnated great, 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 great grandfather who did bad things. And so it's, it, it, it makes you different. Remember, what we believe changes how we believe. Uh, and of course, not many, we, it looks crazy, but some people actually believe that. And uh, no, let's not condemn anyone for their belief system. Such people might become very tender because they don't want to hurt any life or any plan, or anything. So they might be very tender-hearted people. Uh, but whether that is correct or not is a question that we've got to settle.
Then there's a second subgroup of reincarnation where they exclude plants, insects and animals. That means you're reincarnated just in the, as humans, different human lives. That's all. You keep reincarnating and into different human lives. And uh, then, for them, salvation uh, is... Uh, and so hell is just a part of their reincarnation before they come back. And once in the blue moon, you might have someone escape reincarnation and reach a place that is outside the system. That is the reincarnation theory. See, one of the things about Christianity is that we are very open-minded to every view and then we present our view. That's the best type of Christianity that makes you think, question things. You don't accept things just because someone tells you. You think it through. And uh, the traditional style, don't think, just believe. Cannot, cannot, we cannot do that. We must encourage people to think, encourage people to, to see all these different views. And a lot of churches, they are afraid even of touching any view. And as a result, they become very narrow-minded people. They are not aware of what other people's belief systems are. I always recommend this. Whatever people believe, we must give them respect. Because it's a free choice. And we respect them, don't condemn people. And, uh, you know, try to live peaceably with all men. Uh, as much as you can. But that is uh, a reincarnation theory that is there. It has some problems. It has some problems. Because in that theory, it doesn't explain where all these souls are coming from. See, where are these souls coming from? Uh, there's no beginning, and there don't seem to be an end. And then it doesn't explain what happens if someone escaped the system. Uh, where is this place? What is it called? And then, for here they say part of the reincarnation system. But you know there's a flaw there in reincarnation? If reincarnation is reincarnation, the population of the earth should remain the same. After all, it's the same people that keep coming back. <laughs> if the population was 100 million, and it grows to 5.5 billion, you want to know where the rest of the 5.4 billion come from. The other thing is, if there is reincarnation, two, the soul A and soul B, soul number one, soul number two, Soul number one can have reincarnation of A, B, C, D, E, F. Soul number two can have a reincarnation of A, B, C, D, E, F. Soul number one and number two can meet each other at the same time. But soul number one A cannot live at the same time as soul number one E. Because it's supposed to be the same guy. Correct? Because how can E exist when then A hasn't died yet? Since E is supposed to be reincarnation. Haha, <laughs> there you go. In many reincarnation theory, including those by Edgar Casey, they got a lot of people always reincarnation claim to be some famous people in the past. And among the and they actually number the different people who claim to be reincarnated in the Edgar Casey archives. There is one file, I'm still looking for the number, <laughs> but I remember there was one. One occasion where, uh, I'll try to get the exact file number, two, pers two persons who exist at the same time claim to be the reincarnation of some histor historical figure, which is an impossibility because it's like 1K claiming there are two, uh, one K claiming to be one A and then there's another person who might be four K also claiming to be one A. Cannot be. And there was such an occasion, which means that there is a flaw somewhere. It does not explain two things. 
uh, like up here in Christ Christian traditional view, we have a problem with BC and NH. NH are those who never heard. BC are those who were born before Christ came. You cannot throw all of them into hell. Over here, there is a problem in reincarnation. Because there are a lot of movies on reincarnation and all that. But they just move it. They don't think clearly. Movies are made to entertain. To make things sound very emotionally captivating and life-changing, inspiring, you know. Two uh, people died and say, you know, maybe be reincarnated together and everyone cry, everything. But you don't think about the philosophy that if the population, and here's the two problems that are there. And uh, what color did I use? Okay, I use a brownish color, I use a brownish color. And uh, so some of you might not have thought these things, but it was in the back of your mind. And so this helps your thinking process. Let me get the color right. What color did I use? Okay, let me use uh, this color. And uh, so they have a problem with uh, population. Consistency of population. Because the population must remain the same. And then, then you got the question. How long before a person reincarnate? Because this another problem. Is, uh, is it always 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? And then you say, oh, it depends on their earthly life. Okay? If it depends on their early life, actually there should be less and less people because they're delayed coming back. <laughs> there should be less people coming. Because they did so many bad things, so they need uh, maybe 500 years before they, they're allowed to reincarnate. And uh, I, I completely ignore reincarnation into, into insects or uh, animals or trees. I, I remove that, you know. Uh, the, the one is a bit more uh, too complex. And, uh, or rather, it doesn't quite make that much sense. And, uh, and if you say, okay, what about population when you include the first view? I tell you, then there's, uh, you know, it, it still has a population problem because there'll be why so many are animals insects? You know, there are more insects than human beings, right? And uh, there are more animals than human beings. And more, and you say, why so many are trees and insects and human beings so little? <laughs> also, got other question. So I ignore that completely. And uh, but let's say humans to humans reincarnation. You have a problem with population. You couldn't explain the population increase. Where do the souls come from? Plus, you got what I call the origin problem. How did this system start? How did this system start? Where did all the souls come from? It does not explain the beginning of the universe, the beginning of souls. See, there's no, no beginning. And all souls must have a beginning. If there's a beginning, where is a beginning? And now, that's the first problem on the population side. Then, uh, on the reincarnation theory, and then there is a um, second problem in the reincarnation theory as to uh, who is in charge who is in charge of the whole system? Who determines who can reincarnate? Is there a God out there? Is there a system of gods who make these decisions? Who, who, who is in charge? And then if ever they use the name, there is a God, then they say, okay, if there is a God, how did it all begin? Was, was mankind supposed to be like that? And then, here's the thing, the, public, the second question is also a question that questions here. Where do these people go to and where do these souls come from from the beginning? So what you want to understand if you believe in reincarnation, for those who are happening to hear this message online, I know none of you here believe, but you know, all kinds of people go to the website. Then the question is, population, how do you explain it? Second, how did it all start? So if these souls came from somewhere, it must come from this place also. If it came from this place, and then 
Some apparently get back to this place. Then what is this place? It, it's a question mark. It does not explain here the fundamental question of is there a God? It would be like a little ant living near an ant hill and the surrounding and don't know that there are countries in North South America, Canada, Antarctica, Arctic Circle, and Africa, uh, Europe, Middle East, and all the other places. It doesn't know the other thing exists. Is this what humans are stuck in this? And we do not know the answer there. So it raised some questions. Now, this view which I present to you, I will present with scripture, is what we call, you know, uh, the true biblical view supported by scriptures. It is true that, let me use the color, that those who accept Christ do go to heaven. The Bible is true. So it is true. And they also have their own judgment. Remember, there is a believer's judgment and all the other judgments to qualify ourselves. And nobody is qualified to judge except God himself. And our representation of God, Jesus Christ, who is an uncreated being. And um, that is true. But the biblical view on, um, trying to remember the colors. Okay, it's down here. The biblical view on the BC group and on the NH group, those who never heard, is that they have another path we call that the spiritual world and this is based on Romans chapter 2 and the Romans 2 category those who never had a chance to know Christ those who uh, never heard. They are judged based on their own conscience. And even though they never heard Christ, God still gave them a Bible. Not the 66 Bible. God gave them the Romans chapter 1 Bible, which is called the creation. It says in Romans chapter 1, see God is a fair God. In Romans chapter 1, that, um, uh, let me read that scripture because it's important to establish theology on scriptures. Romans chapter 1. Sometimes I have arguments with theologians because, but most of the theologians I have uh, arguments, or good arguments, we're still friends, arguments, is mainly because they're traditional view. And I propose a new view of Christianity. In Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us, he says, um, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest inside them. Can you see that? Without the Bible, you may know the God who already is revealed in your own creation, inside you. For God has shown it to them. This verse is in line with John chapter 1. John chapter 1 tells us about our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, because this is an important philosophy that's based on the Bible. It says in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Then it says here, verse 9, That was the true light which gives light to how many people? How many people? 
every that include men and men and women every man so the light still shine without the Bible it shines to creation and it shines in a conscience even though they never hear I never have heard it says in Romans 2 uh, Romans 1 verse 19 because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them how verse 20 since the creation of the world God's invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made I call that the Bible of creation when you look up at the stars you look within yourself you look up at all the wonders of this world you say there is a being who created all this I will worship that almighty being call it by whatever name so there is called the Bible of creation and then in chapter 2 which is what I call the Romans 2 category so what do we mean by Romans 2 category it tells those who are not Jews or who do not have the law it tells us here remember I asked you the question are all Jews who follow the law strictly safe your answer yes Judaism so then I extend that question a little bit same question extended to this time what about a Jew today who is alive you, when I ask the first question, you're thinking of Jews in the Old Testament. But now what about a Jew in the New Testament? Who believes in Yahweh God. Who has not heard about Jesus Christ. Who follow their Torah. And are good people. Who does not know about Jesus and what he has done. Is the Jew safe? Also. Can you see that? So is in general. Now, that is what Paul said in that time, if they, they do. Then Paul says, verse 14, When Gentiles who do not have the law, like the Mosaic law that God specially gave, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, represent the law see they represent the mosaic law though they don't have the law this law is in nature and somewhere inside called their conscience verse 15 so when I say Romans 2 category is Romans chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 category verse 15 who show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience bearing witness between themselves their thoughts accusing that is condemning them excusing freeing them so these have what the law they don't have a Moses but they still got a law a law in nature now Paul could also include a law in whatever religious belief system they have that is why we say we, I asked about Christianity, then I asked about Jew. Let me extend it. What happened to a good Hindu man or a good Buddhist man who live according to whatever law they understood with their conscience and then they died? Are they? By safe, I mean don't go to hell, right? Are they? Safe or not safe? Have they heard about Jesus? No chance, let's say. Safe? According to Romans 2, 14 and 15, yes. Now listen very carefully. Why do we allow Judaism to go through? And why are we biased against Hinduism, Buddhism, and other religions, or even the Muslim, who might teach the Ten Commandments in their own way? They might add other systems of worship, remember? 
But if they generally teach people to be good, why are we condemning them? When we allow the Jews in, can you see? There is a bias. The bias, you only allow Jews and Christians to go. But what happens if the others have a law in themselves? Of course, the traditional Christianity, you know what the argument is? No, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. They quote from Romans also. Then I will say, did the all include the Jewish people? See, they still get stuck. Because they just allow them into heaven. Remember, all sin and come short of the glory of God shows that we still need the manifestation of Christ in some way. And did Christ manifest? Christ reveals himself even to people who don't even know his name yet. Say, where? 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 I just read to you, John chapter 1. The light shines to every man. So every person who is born has some light. They might not know Christ as Christ. But a little bit. Now, this is called the Romans 2, 14, 15 category. And we need to be open to examine and critic ourselves, Christianity, to understand our bias against all religions, with the exception of Christianity and Judaism. And, and you might say, oh, they've done different things. Hey, Judaism also crucified Jesus and also do bad things. And you want to give testimony, I can tell stories, uh, you know, of how people who live in an orthodox place in Israel also got persecuted by orthodox Jews. Super religious people who attack other people are not good in any religion, including Christianity. Correct? Christianity has shown its bad side in history in the Inquisition period when Christianity had a lot of power. They couldn't handle it. Sin was still present. And they did bad things. They killed in the name of Christ using the, the, the sword. And when the Catholics and Protestants were fighting over in Ireland, they were using guns in the name of Christianity. <coughs> cannot, be, cannot be good. So here's the conclusion. We must believe that God allow all religions to grow, even those that are outside Judaism and Christianity, for one purpose and one purpose alone. To bring forth what we classify as the Ten Commandments. So that those who don't have Moses will still have some form of Ten Commandments. We need to look at that. That, And so we include, we include other religions and other philosophies to show forth that generally and, um, that they are there in order to bring forth um, uh, that God is somehow using this line and uh, let me Okay, then I don't have to draw a new line. That before Christ and those who never heard, in this line, they could be in various religions, but they still make it somewhere here. They still need to know more about God. And then some people question Romans 2, 14 and 15 view. You know the problem they have is this. Then we don't have to preach to anyone. Because all roads lead to Rome. Now, that is a wrong statement. All roads might lead to Rome, but the path of all roads, sometimes some roads take dangerous places before they reach there. And to places you never want to. How many of us scratch our ears this way? No, you always crash from the front. 
So, we don't want to always go this way. Some people can write with their legs, holding the pen in, especially those born with our hand. But how many of us want to learn writing with our toe? No, we only you do that as a last resort when we got no other places. And some people with no legs, no hands, they write holding a pen in their mouth. Because that is a last resort. You can write holding a pen in your mouth. Some people have been fantastic painters who paint people born or people who suffer from all day, you know, God have mercy on all those who have suffered all kinds of uh, physical disability. And so they're doing the best they can in life to do something. So they paint. And we admire people who, who do all those things. That is why when you have this, you ask a question, why then do we still have to preach Christ? Because you have to examine what happened here. Over here, now, bad people, in our view, and in all religious view, the bad ones, you know, who did not obey their conscience, still end up in hell. <laughs> all right. So there is the hell still. So people must learn to be good. People must learn to be people of conscience. Learn to be fair, just. But here's a good thing. Actually, this is good for any country who wants to bring religious harmony. Because then when you sit at the table with people, good people from different religions, you are sincerely believing that they are good and that they are also will end up at a spiritual plane we call heaven. And that is really genuine. Whereas this one is not genuine. This one is still at war. And you're sitting across what you call a heathen. Someone who you deem going to hell. And you're forced to sit at the table. Or you're sitting at the table, you know, just for dipl diplomacy. And not really including them as part of those who are safe. This is a better view for what we call harmony of all religions. Now, when we look at this area here, heaven is more complex than we realize. Heaven, I'm leading to the overcomer topic, you need to have all this at the back of your mind. And I don't take for granted nowadays that everybody knows this, because they might not have thought carefully about that. So clear up all the doubts. In heaven, there are different layers. What is heaven? How do we define heaven? Okay, then we define uh, this area here. So this area here, I'm going to use, is there a dark blue? My palette is limited here. This blue, let's use purple, I haven't used purple yet. Okay. In heaven, there must be this. In heaven, there must be different levels of knowing God. So we don't talk about different levels of heaven yet. Let's talk about different levels of knowing God. Some people who really know God, some people who just know there's a heaven. Ah, that's it. They, they don't really know the being who created all things and all things heaven. So there must be layers of knowing God. And as the layers form into its own thing, it form into seven layers called the seven heaven. Also supported by scripture in the sense that Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I have been to the third heaven. So if there is a third heaven, there must be a first and a second, correct? And if there's a third heaven, there's a possibility of having a four, five, six, seven, and so forth if they want. Because Paul never said this is a final either. We know 
that from uh, the if you interpret the seven churches as seven spirits, then they equal seven heavens. That's what we understood about the seven heaven. Now you might read some books of people with ND, NDE near death experience or uh, OBE out of body experience, and they might describe many layers of heaven, 70 layers of heaven, different layers. It is all perspective. Within the biblical seven heaven based on the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and this is a part where we're teaching about overcomers. In this part, some sections are subdivided into many, many layers. And this area in heaven, can I take it and put it to a different chart since there's no space there? So, I take this one and expanded it. It actually looks like that. God is above and Christ at His right hand and the Holy Spirit, seven spirits of God flowing through all of creation. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The seven spirits cause the seven heaven. I told you that we have a heavenly perspective. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, there's seven layers already, nicely. Cause the seven layers of heaven. Within each layer, now, first heaven, Counting from Paul, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Counting from Paul, this first heaven is huge. And it contains our, our present visible universe and the multiple layers. It's not just 70, thousands and thousands and thousands of layers inside. Paradise, the first paradise and all that. Because it's so huge, it has to be subdivided. See, when you have a population of uh, gazillions, including angels, different planets, it has to be a lot of divisions. Uh, as it goes up, less and less people progress further and further up. Paul says he has been to here, third heaven. If that is the thing, then we come back this picture here. Why do we still preach Christ? Because of two things. I give you two reasons. This view is correct, and we still have to preach Christ because of two things. Number one, general religion is not strong enough without the Holy Spirit power to help people live a righteous life in the conscience so that they don't go to hell, sin and go to hell. That's number one. Because we know Christianity claims this in the Bible. God revealed Himself. All religions is man scrapping through whatever God has revealed in the past, here and there, dreams, visions, religious book, everywhere, that try to reach out to the perfection that God wants man to live by. And because of that, all religion generally teach, be good, so that at the end of your life, your good works and your bad works are measured, and then it will sink to the other side. But the flesh is weak even when the Spirit is willing. We still need to preach Christ because Jesus provides the answer to live a sin-free life. In many movies, there's a latest Korean movie where one of the famous actors, uh, he worked as a fireman and then he died and then he got these uh, two uh, advocates of his who tried to get him into a good place to reincarnate kind of thing and then they found that they has reincarnated many times and um, 
then um, so it's just a movie but it was all based on this the doctrine of reincarnation the doctrine of all religions is based on one fact good works good sincere works from the heart and that's where we still need to preach the gospel because the ability to tread this line the energy to be a good person especially as the world becomes worse and worse as the antichrist the bible talks about antichrist antichrist comes it gets harder and harder to walk this line how many Cornelius are there one out of hundred thousand million correct and then some people might never had a chance at least Nebuchadnezzar started as a bad guy then he was punished because he became like an animal the good thing is he had a good guy he had two occasions when he encountered God one was when he built a golden statue and then he, everyone who didn't worship the statue will be burned. Oh, what a cruel man. Burn alive. When Shadrach, Mishan and Abednego did not want to burn, he made the fire hotter, so hot that the people who opened the door immediately died. I mean, so fierce was his anger and wrath. And when they threw Shadrach and Mishan and Abednego in, they came out alive. Not even a smell of fire was on them. And he acknowledged, your God is the great true God. So there is him coming to know God. His second encounter with God was in the second dream that he had, that Daniel warned him, you know, repent, do good, and uh, don't do evil. And then he forgot and he became proud. As he walked in his hanging gardens, he says, isn't this all that I made? And then a voice called the Watcher, which is a type of angel who records things, says, Today is a day of judgment. Good thing it was all done on earth. And he went wild, and Daniel had to rule the empire for a while. But at the end of seven years, he humbled himself, and he acknowledged God. So he came into that category. But remember, not everyone has the opportunity. It so happened he had a good man of God next to him. Do you realize it's a good man of God next to him that helped him to be safe? What happened Daniel not there? I don't think Nebuchadnezzar could be safe. He'd be worse and worse. And because of Daniel, people like King Cyrus uh, and then Darius, Darius loved Daniel and loved his God. See, the people who know their God are the salt of the earth. And you know there are different quality of salt. All good religion is like salt that keeps people from decaying. That's why every society needs a good religion. Because people are, need to worship a God. And those who are, you know, uh, atheism might claim they can do different things and all that. But there's a hunger for religion. Look at communism. After a time when it collapsed, poor oh, people went back to God. Still, because there's a human hunger for someone beyond our human power. And today's movies about mutants, supernatural power, and uh, special, special abilities are all showing us a hunger for the supernatural something beyond science, technology that can exist and the Bible is full of miraculous stories Jesus walking on water fire coming down from heaven creative healings so it speaks about the supernatural so number one we still need to preach Christ because we need to create the salt Sometimes we are just there. And you could be like a Daniel standing with a good 
a, we a, we a man who could, could at any time fall over the slope. And because of you, that person stay on this line and reaches here and then fall down into hell. We still need to preach the gospel. Number two, the gospel is not just trying to get us here. If you read the Bible, Jesus didn't send out to make converts. Jesus sent out to make disciples. A difference between disciple and converts is this. A disciple is someone who knows God and followed the fullness of the principles of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, and walk in His love too. Walk like Jesus walked, and who know God like Jesus knows God. So the purpose of Christianity on earth is to reveal the highest realm of heaven. Since Christianity claimed to be God revealing Himself, correct? That is the claim. Whether it be traditional Christianity or this, you know, uh, the biblical view of <laughs> Christianity, we claim that this is the Word of God. Then it should have the answer to all of the mysteries of the universe. Since it is supposed to reveal the mysteries of the universe, it's the final revelation. And it comes from God to us, not we create ourselves. And we say that Jesus has risen from the dead. He's alive. Which gives us the third reason why we need to, to preach the gospel. Because only one who conquers death can help others overcome death. And Jesus is risen from the dead. And he continued to work and do signs and wonders and miracles. That's the third reason why we still need to preach the gospel. See, this doesn't prevent us from the urgency of preaching the gospel. It just gives us where we are. Now, having understood this, now you know why we have to be overcomers. If Christianity doesn't present the best and the highest picture of Almighty God, if Christianity don't behave like Jesus Christ, it's not loving like Jesus Christ, it's not fair like Jesus Christ, it's not long-suffering like Jesus Christ, does not show the attributes and the meekness and the tenderness of Jesus Christ, then we have a false Christianity. There is a religion without true spirit of Christ. Now you know why we have to be overcomers. Because we have to preach to the world at this highest level. We are saying to the world, this is the revelation that comes from God. That is why we must be overcomers. Now, I want to point to something else. <clears throat> Remember this one? It has no solution for where the souls come from. And in this view, and in this view, all souls come to the earth once, and after that comes the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, 27. It's appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So there is none of this reincarnation. That is that. Now, if we all come once and then we go back, hopefully nobody ends in hell and everybody is supposed to go back. And there are still people coming and being born. It brings us to this. There must be a place where the souls are kept who are coming to the earth. This will be, this will be the original, the first time it came here. Correct? Because where are the souls coming from? 
Since you don't believe in reincarnation, they're not coming from old souls who die. They have to come from a fresh place in heaven. Some sort of storehouse of spirit and souls waiting to come to the earth to be born. Correct? It's the only logical conclusion. If you believe Hebrews 9, verse 26 to that everyone come once. Then they go back, hopefully they don't end up in hell, but they go back all the way safely. Where is this place in heaven? Where is such a place? And there is. It's a place called hidden in God. And hidden in God is a place where souls are prepared before they come to earth. Now if that is where the souls are prepared and they come to the earth, prepared and they come to the earth, then there is a second question that we need to deal with, which ties to this message on overcomers. What is the question? You know why some people believe in reincarnation? Because they believe in karma. That means if this life you have a difficult life, it's because the previous life you were not such a good fellow. So now you've got to live this life to work out all the bad things you did the previous life. Now, if all the bad things that you did in the previous life didn't get erased in this life, and you add more bad things, that means this guy is getting worse and worse. <laughs> and actually, there's another reason why you cannot believe in reincarnation because how many people actually succeed in eradicating the things that do, supposedly do, in their, from their previous past? Humans are humans. With each life, they add more sin, not less sin. You know, I think you know, we each side they add more sin. And don't forget, you've got to define sin. There are sins of actions and sins in the heart. And the Bible says the sins in the heart are worse than actually outside sins. Because the Pharisees sin more than the sinners on the street. Their sin was just uh, Jesus pronounced a judgment. Jesus never pronounced a judgment on uh, the publicans and all the other sinners. So they explain the suffering that people go through based on karma. It sounds like a good explanation, but you analyze it deeper. It assumes that with each cycle of reliving the life, you could get less and less and better and better. But the, the general thing is actually humans atrophy. We get worse and worse with time. And you bring what you came before to make it even worse and worse. And so that but, but it was interesting that they had to explain. Then you ask the question, why do we have to explain about this life? Because if we came from a place somewhere, why are some people's life easier and why are some people's life harder? That's one of the things we must explain and see the overall view before we teach on how to overcome. Because if I teach you how to overcome, you're still struggling. Why must I overcome? Why must I have this life? I haven't cured you yet. <laughs> now you know why I'm going through this. We all came from a place where we were prepared before we came to earth. Because you don't believe in reincarnation. You believe that all come once and then they go back. If we came from that place and we came with different lives, there are a lot of questions. There must be some level of choice, some level of advice, some level of counsel in the life that we came and we choose. Whereas reincarnation, the explanation for this life is caused by the previous life, is caused by the previous life, caused by the previous life, caused by the previous life, etc. And they explain why some people's life are easy, some are not. But here is the opposite. If nobody has experienced life on earth before and everyone came from some place hidden in God, straight, why are some people born with this, born with that? 
Why are some people's life more difficult than others? Some people are born with a golden spoon. Some people are born with a wooden spoon. Some people are born with no spoon. So, we ask, why? And there comes the explanation. The earth was already, remember, once upon a time, the earth fell in under Satan. Then when the whole world was recreated, God recreated the earth and the earth fell again under Adam. And then it got worse. You read the story in the book of Genesis 6. The earth becomes so bad that God has to destroy the whole world through a flood, leaving only, start all, all over again. Restart button was pressed with eight souls. Eight souls that started the whole human race all over again. And then it began to go worse now with the Antichrist, false prophets already born, and it's in that direction. I said God has promised that He won't destroy the whole world the same way He destroyed. And then the Bible says, the law in Galatians says, came to sort of postpone the decay of the earth. So the law was given to, so that the earth don't uh, go worse. It was like a temporary measure until Christ can be revealed. So then you saw the whole story that God wanted to reveal Christ on earth. And whatever He has to do is to prevent the earth from self-destruct before Christ can come. Now that Christ has come, and His end time move has begun, then we realize there is a purpose for the earth to reveal Christ still. And we are the final revelation. The church is the final revelation of Christ on the planet earth. Christ is going to come through His church. And then the end. So all the different difficulties that you go through life, not to say that, you know, some difficulties are because of actions and reactions, or different, like you might have different choices. At each choice, there's a different road. But yet, if you're born at the bottom of the, of the heap, you've got a long way to climb. Some are born, you know, to a life, and each one got their challenges. Because if you're born into royalty, the pressure, the Pressure is always to appear right. If you're born into obscurity, nobody cares what, whatever decision you do, you know, how you dress, you know, how you go out. If you're born to royalty, every time you got up already from, you got to, you got to leave the kind of life. And not, some royalties cannot stand it also. Because they're always living in a glass house. So each life has its challenges. And here is the thing. The challenges on this life was determined here, not here. Nor is it caused by this recycle. There is a law of uh, sowing and reaping. It's called a mini law of karma kind of thing, but it's a sub-law. But it cannot explain all things. This life is chosen by this. For example, why should Jesus be born in a manger? He could be born in the best palace. He could be born in the best of the best of the best. Why should Jesus be born in that little neighborhood in Bethlehem and he grew up in Nazareth. He could have grown up in Jerusalem. And the life that Jesus himself chose, we know that he's predestined. It was a life that was simple, a life with a lot of challenges, a life with a lot of rejection. He came to his own, and his own did not know him. He was at one time rejected by his own brothers. His mother never rejected him. Remember, his brothers didn't believe in him, also at one time. Then he was 
abandoned by his disciples. He was wrongly accused, crucified innocently, and yet he went through all those things. He said, oh, he did it for us. But he needed all the suffering in order to show that it's not a problem if your life is suffering. Why was Joseph's life a life that had some suffering? 13 years. He was born the favorite son of Jacob. Sold as a slave, betrayed by his brothers. Wrongly accused and placed in prison. But at every point, he excelled. Because of this interesting law, without the opportunity to hate, one cannot grow deep in love. Without the opportunity to face fear, one doesn't develop great faith. Without being faced by a society that doesn't believe in God, one's faith in God is not challenged. Without facing poverty and lack, one does not know the God of provision. Without facing sickness and disease, one does not know the God who is a healer. Why should a person called Kenneth E. Hagen predestined, now he has gone home, we can discuss his life, predestined to be the one man who personifies faith, the modern faith movement? What kind of Childhood should be designed for him so that he can become a man of great faith. You know what kind of childhood? Born prematurely with five incurable sicknesses and disease. By the time he was a teenager, given up to die, the religious priest who go there told his mother, and he could hear them talking, let's prepare for him to die. And he over here, he said, I want to live, I want to live. He's only a teenager. And even after he exercised Mark 11, 23, 24, and was healed, it says he was challenged by, they say, oh, now that you're okay, you know, don't worry, we will, we will take a ride to school so you don't overstrain yourself. He said, no, I want to walk to school. There was a determination in him. He wanted to be as healthy as anybody else. He walked to school. And he said he was still fighting symptoms. In other sermons, he said, you know, he looked like immediately he got healed. But he was fighting the symptoms. But by the time he grew up, ready for ministry, he was a man of faith. Now tell me, if you are to design, if, if you are one of those architects here working under God, to design a life on this planet, to create a person of great faith, will you make a person be born with a golden spoon? <laughs> with no difficulties in his life, everything paid nicely, maybe even born a royalty, had a good easy life, and then go out in the ministry, I don't think that person will have faith. Can you see that? What was Smith Vigor's word? He was, he was, he didn't have an education. He was a plumber. <coughs> and if you read his life carefully, one of his greatest sorrow was so many family members that he know died, including his own children. He could have slammed the door of faith and said, I don't believe God anymore. But with each failure, he rise higher. He rise higher. He said, no, the Bible must still be right. The Bible must still be right. And all his life, one of the people he couldn't cure was his own family. 
But at other times he's faking through. When his wife died, he didn't want his wife to die. He put on the one uh, and she said, come on, I command you, come back. And then she come back and said, please let me go. <laughs> All these good stories, but you didn't hear the other stories of his struggle against sickness and disease. Or the story of how he passed out a whole bottle of kidney stones in the peak of his ministry. And he refused to go any easy way. Great faith comes from great fire. So if you were to design a life that will become the personification of love, let's say you design a life, where would you put Smart Alex, that person to be born in? Maybe in an environment that's full of hate. <laughs> there you go. Maybe, you know, the mother got rejection. Family broken, uh, father died, mother died, adopted by a horrible grand aunt. <laughs> but, but, <pastor>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, okay, here comes the but. Uh, uh, can we give you the mic so that those online can hear? Yeah. You see, I've, I've, uh, Is this mic on? I cannot hear. Hello? Is it blue mic? Blue mic. Yeah. Blue mic. Yeah, blue. Hello? Uh, yeah, okay. I've also read stories of uh, people who have uh, uh, be, been born in, who have had difficult childhoods. You know, people I know. Uh, like Hitler and Stalin. Uh, yeah. These people, they were born in uh, an environment of hate and they grew up to become the worst dictators. In the that country. is true also. Yeah. So, so it works both ways. Uh, it works both ways. But definitely not easy environment. Okay, good point there. Now, here's the thing. If you design a life that is difficult, remember, you could also become the most hateful person. Because that is the danger of coming. There is a risk involved. The risk is you might not make it. Because it's like everyone who comes has to be like SAS training. <laughs> so there's a risk that you might choose wrongly and turn the other way. So there is always a risk. Now when you see the overall picture of the design of this world and this life, then you look at, you already understood why we have to overcome. Because on this earth, while you were in heaven, in the hidden place, a life was designed for you in order for you to make the right choices and overcome all your difficulties. And sometimes the wish, dream and visions are very I remember in, a, in my church in Malaysia long ago, uh, there was this person, I think she was uh, in the medical field, but she got so much brokenness in her life. And uh, then, uh, and, and, and her family was also broken. But one thing, she was one of those women born can see a lot of visions. And she talked to these spirit beings or angels, at that time she doesn't know who they were. Then I described they were like angels. And then one day, and it was a lady, and, and she was in church. She, and she had, I know from her history, she had a life of tears and suffering. And then in one of her visions she shared with me was this. When she encountered this angel or being, he says, then the angel showed all the sufferings and says, this was your destiny. And then the angel showed her rewards in heaven and say, these are your rewards. And then she accepted her life of suffering and her, all the tears that she went through and she became a better person. She began to be filled with joy. It is possible that one does not choose correctly. But your difficulties and things that you had overcome was designed from here in heaven. That's when you know that your life was designed. Which country you're going to be born in also? Because some of you, 
might be born, you know, let's say, you know, our, our, our dear, you know, a helper there, you know, to the two sisters born in Indonesia and then helping her. Every life is designed for a reason. Or you're born in Singapore, or born in Australia, or born in the US, every life is designed for something. And you don't compare your life with other life. You just want to say, whoever you are, wherever you are, you do the right thing, you overcome all your challenges, and you rise, and I have to bring some of this to your conclusion, you rise to one important thing. You must know how, and here's the thing, let me use the red line, how to get back. The road back is an important thing. And to have the road back, you must see what you're supposed to become. Which I will close, and then in the second service I'll do more. I'll close with Romans also, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, remember this. This is the goal for every one of us as overcomers. Your goal is not to be rich, not to be famous, not to you know, be the most powerful, uh, not to be the most successful, although all those things are included as a supplementary bonus. Your main goal should be in Romans chapter 8. It tells us, and uh, as it begins to talk about predestination in verse 29, your goal is Romans 8 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And the glorified include transformation of the body. Your goal is to be 100% like Jesus. In his character, in his walk. So if you were born a royalty, you will be what Jesus would be in royalty. If you were born in poverty, you will be what Jesus would be in poverty. In any color of skin that you were born in, in any culture that you were born in, you must know how to get back there to the ending. To be like Jesus in everything. And make sure all your choices always ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? That is why Christianity is the best of the best of the best. You don't have to ask a thousand questions. You only have to ask because Christianity has Jesus Christ. The perfect manifestation of what a human being can be. And you only have to ask one question. What would Jesus do in my situation? Then you do with all your heart. Even if it's you know, not sufficiently clear, you do the best with all your heart in that direction. What would Jesus do in your situation? And do it with all the best of your heart. Conforming to Jesus in your heart, in your mind, in your character. So once we establish that that's the main thing, and here's the other thing. Do you know that before Jesus came, Jesus was looking for a man or woman who can do like that? And once in a while, there are men and women of God who walk that way. I could imagine all the angels clapping. Lord, there's one more. Lord, there's one more. And then they stumble. Abraham told a lie. You know, uh, David committed adultery. Samson married wrongly. <laughs> fall in love with the wrong woman and uh, Moses murdered somebody so all of them, they, they started walking and then they stumbled, they stumbled and then God's grace still was there to help but there was no one found 
who could be perfect like Jesus. No one found. But now that Jesus has come, you know what Jesus' goal is? He wants to reproduce more of himself in every one of us. Hebrews 2 tells us he has become the captain over us to make us all exactly like him. And he is our goal. I pray that Jesus be your hero. In our modern world, people have made sports figures our hero. Business leaders our hero. Political leaders our hero. All these are good people. Learn from every one of them. But the most important thing, it would be a shame to Christianity if Jesus was not your hero. And if we hear from the little children, in Sunday school and all that, they say, what would you like when you grow up? I want to be Superman. I want to be the help. I want to be this. That means we didn't teach them enough. And it cannot be forced. We have not presented how lovely our Lord Jesus is. How wonderful He is. How powerful He is. So that not enough people are falling in love with Jesus to be like Him. And that's the job of the church and the job of every preacher. To present Christ unto everyone fall in love with Christ and want to follow Jesus. Then we can learn how to overcome all the different, different things as we pursue the supreme goal. Our predestination is to be that. Beyond your predestination to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Beyond your predestination to be a successful professional. Beyond your predestination to be whatever personification you are. It's a predestination to be like Jesus. That's who we are. Let's pray. Let's all rise together as we pray. Father, we pray that you transform our heart, our life, until we see Jesus for all His splendor, all His glory. For that's who He is, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for all that you are. And we love you, Jesus. We love you for who you are. Yes, Father God, forgive your church, forgive your ministers. Forgive us, the people who are saved by the very blood of Jesus. When we turn aside to present a wrong picture of Christ, when we didn't fully present Christ to make Him great, wonderful, beautiful, so that people fall in love with Christ. But help us, Lord, in this end time, to present Jesus in all His splendor, in all His glory, his character and help us to present Christ through our very lives to how we handle problems crises and situations to how we handle people difficult people easy people hard people soft people to how we handle mountains and valleys storms and deserts and wilderness Help us to be the people who at each time can handle it the way Jesus handles and reflect the fullness of Christ in our lives, in our character, in our words, in our behavior, in all that we do. Let this be so. For this is the number one predestination for everyone who came to know Jesus. And that sets us apart as different from every other revelation. Because we are called to be like Jesus. Thank you, Father. Seal this love that we have for Jesus. And help us to grow more and more in love with Jesus day by day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap of offering.